at our shop uh, over at Mount Vernon, which is some hooks and nails. Nail header is interesting. Uh, there's a lot of buildings to take care of, and not just the buildings themselves, but the work that we do there. We really try and represent Washington's life by demonstrating farming techniques or maybe just the way that uh, life was lived at that time, which means I'm producing tools and utensils and uh, you know, hardware, anything that's required to keep that, that establishment running. And so what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to warm up with just a few simple projects, which are things that uh, we do pretty frequently at our shop uh, over at Mount Vernon, which is some hooks and nails. Uh, obviously, those are things that are needed quite frequently in uh, colonial life. Nails, as necessary as they were, were not typically made at Mount Vernon. A lot of people assume that, you know, they're gonna be doing things like that constantly, uh, but really it was only a handful here or there. Long before Washington's lifetime, nail making was done commercially in England. And so you've got these big shops that do nothing but make nails all day long. And they're actually producing between two to 4,000 nails a day per person. That's a lot. Uh, so Washington is actually a very good businessman and realizes pretty early on he can save money by buying his nails and have his blacksmiths there producing farm tools. That was, the, uh, that was the business at Mount Vernon, was farming. And so that's what they spend all their time doing, is really just taking care of that stuff. If it's something else, if they, uh, they need it immediately, you know, his smiths can go ahead and take care of it. But largely, all these other items are gonna be purchased. Now that's what makes my job just a little bit different at Mount Vernon. You know, I do anything they ask me for. Uh, so sometimes that's nails, Sometimes, you know, we're making axes. Uh, we even did curtain rods once. That was a, a fun little project. Now, what I really like doing is not just talking about blacksmithing, um, but to encourage everyone else if they have questions. You know, we'll go ahead and answer questions about blacksmithing and kind of lead the topic in whatever direction you all want. So does anybody here have any questions about the, uh, the work we do or Mount Vernon or anything along those lines? None at all? Is schooling back, was it just apprenticeship under master? It was uh, traditionally done through apprenticeship. Now, American apprenticeship is uh, very different. And so early on, the guilds run blacksmithing and you're going to sign a contract uh, how long your apprenticeship is going to be under the master. You have to perform certain tasks. You actually have to take tests. And it's almost like certification moving on to journeyman work. Here in America, the difference is that there is more work than there are skilled craftsmen. And so what was decided is that the guild should no longer control that. It should be done by the master. And so they the apprenticeship itself became a lot more loose. And so what was a standard seven-year apprenticeship for general smithing became, how long do you need? You know, and so typically we're gonna see about three to five years of training before you move on to journeyman. Um, now this is gonna create two things. One, it's gonna mean that in general, American blacksmithing skill levels aren't necessarily what we're seeing in Europe. Uh, it's a, a lot more basic work, a lot more rushed work. Uh, the other thing we're going to see is that we're being a little more innovative about what we're doing. You know, we want to hurry up and get the job done, which means sometimes experimenting with tools, experimenting with the process that previously the guilds were saying, no, we want you to do it this way. So what I'm doing here, starting this nail out, I'm just going to slowly draw out the tip, get a nice, point going on it. I like using the horn for this because it, it's very aggressive and draws it out pretty quickly. And then by using the face, I'll go ahead and smooth up those corners.
So we've got the start of our nail right there, taking that down into a nice taper. Now you can see what I've done by using the uh, corner of the anvil is create a little shoulder there. The reason I did that is uh, when I put the head on, it's going to seat down in my nail header here. So my next step, I'm going to go ahead and heat it back up. I'm going to cut it off the bar and then put the head on. Now the process of making a nail, I mean, really doesn't take a whole lot, <clears throat> but it can be a very repetitive job, particularly when you're making thousands of them. And it just amazes me that people dedicated their life's work to making nails, spending every day doing this. A uh, general work day in the 18th century is going to be about sunrise to sunset. Uh, most people are going to be working at least six days a week. Um, so that's a, it's a long day. <laughs> uh, it's going to come up to roughly, we're looking about 20 seconds, 15 seconds a nail. Um, I've actually read reports uh, saying that in some of those nailleries, uh, they would actually have women and children working there too. Um, and it said that uh, a young girl, which would probably put her about 12 years or so, was expected to make at least three nails a minute. That's why I'm glad those shops aren't still running. I don't want a little girl coming in and telling me I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> now the heat on this is very important. You want to you get your metal to just the right heat. If it's too cold, it's going to crack and break. It's not going to form into what you want. If it's too hot, you're actually going to start burning it and melting it, um, which is also obviously not a, a good way of making a living at this. So you get it to a nice, nice color there. That iron a lot different than, that metal different than what they used back then? It is. I'm using mild steel right now which is modern, and at that time uh, they're using wrought iron. Wrought iron has a, a fibrous quality to it, and so the, uh, the steel here, the mild steel, actually has a crystalline structure. It's pretty uniform. Um, it's a uh, molecular structure, uh, whereas the wrought iron, uh, because it's fibrous, works almost like wood. If you don't work it correctly, it actually starts to splinter and shear apart, which means working it at uh, high heats and uh, even pressure. I went ahead and just notched it there. I love working wrought iron. It, uh, it's very smooth, in my opinion. It's, it's softer, it's more malleable. Uh, it really wants to be worked. Um, but they stopped producing it somewhere between the 1940s and 1960s. Uh, at that point is where we're we really see the wrought, or wrought iron uh, disappearing as um, mild steel is cropping up. What's ideal with the mild steel is that you can stick this into a machine and it's going to punch out the same item each time. The wrought iron won't do that. So go ahead and snap that off right there. Just. There we go. Got now. Just imagine doing that all day long. Uh, this one looks like a six penny. I didn't measure it though. Yeah. So, does anyone want to see that done in real time? How I do it at Mount Vernon? All right. When I'm in production mode, as we call it. It really depends on the shop. And yeah, it depends on the shop. And so a lot of sort of backwoods country shops would operate with one person, maybe an assistant. Um, uh, but you would have your own projects. Other shops are going to run in a very similar atmosphere that we have today, where you have many people with their own tasks. All right, so.
That's not too bad, under a minute. Now the first one I cooled down, um, and you'll typically see people do that, uh, cool down the nails. Uh, sometimes it's to get it out of the, the nail header. Um, as the metal is uh, heated, it actually expands. You put it down into the nail header, sometimes it gets stuck. So you put it down in there, quench it, shrinks it, and you can just knock it out. I tend not to quench my nails, as that can actually have more negative uh, reactions with the metal than positive. And so if you have a, a good even temper and you head the, the nail while it's still hot, um, it tends to come out pretty easily. Is, is a square nail stronger than a modern nail? Or what, what are the performance differences between a colonial nail and a modern nail? Um, that is an excellent question right there. And so I find that the, uh, the round nails, uh, whereas cheaper and faster to make, which is why we have them today, uh, they punch a hole straight through the wood, whereas the square, na square nails, uh, by their nature, um, they're all hammered out. They have uh, imperfect corners, tend to grip the wood. The other thing it's going to do is as you drive it in, it's actually going to swivel in with the wood rather than just punching a hole straight through. Uh, some of our carpenters over at Mount Vernon have actually said that if they misdrive a nail, if they drive it in the wrong spot, they didn't mean to, they have to cut off the head, drive it the rest of the way through because they can't pull it out. So I'm going to go. Hmm? Yes, you can, which is uh, obviously not a, a good thing to do uh, because it makes it more brittle. You could break it. Now, the, the mild steel and the iron isn't really capable of being hardened. Because uh, when you're hardening it, you're affecting the carbon content. But with both wrought iron and the, uh, the modern mild steel, you can't always count that it doesn't actually have carbon in it. You know, the wrought iron, the way it's produced is it's smelted with charcoal, which is, uh, you know, carbon. Uh, so it can migrate into it, creating something uh, close to a, a working steel. So the iron, the iron yeah. Now, the mild steel is, in America is mostly produced by recycling old metal, and sometimes they don't mix it up so well, and so you find that ball bearing. And so that'll, that'll harden up pretty well. So I'll go ahead and do one more nail, and then I'm going to go ahead and switch projects here. Yes, I did. Uh, the nail header I'm using and the hammer, I've made both of these. The nail header is interesting. It's a, a very classic way of making a 18th century tool. I'll actually show that off a bit here so you can see it. My hammer's made the same way, but you can actually see it on this one. Uh, so in the 18th century, they have steel but it's expensive, and so you use it sparingly. The body of this tool right here is made out of wrought iron, and I just took a little bit of steel, and it's welded right onto the face here to give me a good impact surface, so it's gonna hold its form while I'm heading the nail. Uh, but the iron is also going to absorb the shock to help prevent that steel from cracking and breaking. And so you can actually see along the corners here where that steel plate is resting on. This is also an example of you know, why you don't buy the mechanic's car. If I was making this for somebody else, I'd have that all completely <laughs> sealed up and you wouldn't even be able to notice, but this uh, works for me just fine. My hammer is made the same way, where the body of this would be wrought iron, and then steel welded on the face and the pin, the two uh, working portions of it. Now when you say welded, how was that done? 
Yeah, so um, today we often think of welding done with uh, machines. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, long before that, welding is done by hand. And so what we actually do is we take the two pieces of metal, we heat them up in the fire to a point where the surface begins to melt, but the core remains solid. And then by applying pressure, we fuse those two pieces into one. Uh, often when you do this correctly, there will be no seam, there will be no weld mark. It will actually be one piece of metal when you're done. Um, now, some people use a welding flux. The English traditionally did not use a welding flux when they did that. The wrought iron has a, a self-fluxing nature uh, because of the uh, silica slag that's found in it. Now, what's difficult about some of these welds, uh, I found particularly with the hammer, is that the steel has a different melting point than the iron. Uh, iron has a higher melting point, so you have to preheat the iron before you weld that steel on there. Not the English. The English wouldn't uh, use a, a flux for that. Um, well, when they were using fluxes, they tended to be uh, sand, salt, lime. Uh, borax was being used in the 18th century, but it was expensive, and so it was used primarily as a jeweler's flux. Now, I always get this confused because one area makes me think of the other, but borax was either being mined in Turkey or it was being mined in Hungary. I can't remember which one, but. I think of one, I think of the other. An item called a J-hook, which is a hook with a nail on it. That is the beginning of a scroll right there. Just hammer it out to a nice taper and round it out. go. Got our scroll on there. Now, what's nice about that scroll is uh, with these hooks, you know, even if you just cut it, it has a little sharp edge on it. And so that scroll is actually going to help any snagging or poking or anything you don't want it to do. Uh, if I was making, say, a meat hook, it's one of the only times I've ever made a hook that actually comes out into a point meant to poke through stuff. Got our little hook on there. Um, the color is a very good indicator of the temperature. Um, and so different colors are going to tell me where it's at. The brighter it is, the hotter it is. Uh, generally, I'm, I want to work with this around 2,000 degrees, uh, which is going to be a, a bright orange uh, color. Um, you can go all the way up to white. White is the ideal temperature for, say, forge welding, because um, you're right at that melting point. It's also the ideal temperature for working wrought iron. Uh, however, it's a very dangerous one in that you're just one step away from ruining your work.
That's the other thing is this fire is more than capable of destroying what you're working on if you're not paying attention. With the assistance of the, uh, the blower there, forcing oxygen into that fire, that's going to heat up to about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That depends on how much money they want to make. Uh, and so you can have several irons in the fire, but that's, there's also a warning against that because you're dividing your attention. Uh, so if I was a, say, a professional nailer, I probably would have several bars in there because the idea isn't to sit here and wait for something to warm up, it's to have it already ready. And so just keeping several bars in there. Too many bars and you're going to start burning some of them or you're going to divide your heat and they're not going to heat up enough for each one. I'm fortunate that I work in a very laid back atmosphere where I can focus on just one project at a time and not worry about too much else. Looks familiar, got a nail right there. This is different. This is a, a more modern anvil uh, than would have been available in the 18th century. Uh, colonial anvils um, tend to have uh, much more width right down in here in the hips. Um, the face is wider. Uh, they don't have a pritchel hole, which is this hole right here, or the step right there. See, just about every portion of the anvil can be used. There we go. So, J hook. Simple little hook with a nail in it. I'm going to do uh, one more project before I move on to where I really feel like doing tonight, which is going to be uh, some knives. I'm going to go ahead and make an S-hook. Again, very common item. Uh, S-hook is just a double-sided hook. Now these are typically found in kitchens. You can find them uh, hanging pots over a fire. Uh, they also help with temperature control, and so if you want to, you know, get your pot closer to the fire, add some S-hooks. If you want to get it further away, go ahead and remove some S-hooks. Uh, now, S-hooks are used for many other things during the colonial time period. They're just most well known for cooking, uh, but they're so broadly used, I've actually heard them referred to as the 18th century duct tape. I find it's very applicable. They just all over the place see them using. The definition of blacksmith is uh, somebody who works with black metal, which is iron and steel. And so by definition, that's what we work with. Uh, the other metals 
tend to work a little bit differently. It's not that we can't work with it, it's that it's just generally not our training or expertise. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just squaring up this bar. It's a round stock. I'm squaring it up. This is going to allow for some other ornamentation on it later. And by hammering it from a, a round piece to a square piece, uh, the other thing I'm doing is I'm actually, t actually texturing the material. Uh, today, when people buy ironwork, they want to see those hammer marks. They want to see uh, that you did some work on it. And it really speaks out to the quality of the work where not only are there imperfections, but it's done perfectly. In the 18th century, uh, they were actually trying to remove that. And so things were looking much more machined. In fact, one of my favorite tools at our blacksmith shop at Mount Vernon is called the flatter. And it does just what it sounds like. It flattens things. And so after I work on something, I'd be able to take the flatter, put it on the metal, and start flattening it out so it's one nice sheet. You can't see the hammer marks in it. But that's not what people want to see today. Very early on, uh, blacksmiths were making their own metal. And that's, that's dating back to when we first start settling here. Uh, but then very quickly, uh, we start producing iron furnaces where they're going to make it. And so Kip had touched on that earlier, uh, Saugus being one of those early iron smelters. By the 18th century, we are producing a lot of iron. By 1760, so mid-18th century, the colonies here are the third largest producers of iron in the world. And so we're using a uh, process uh, utilizing blast furnaces that's creating a couple of tons of iron at a time. Um, and the iron itself was actually earmarked to be sent back to England. And then England was going to refine it, produce product, and then sell it back to the colonists. And it simply uh, didn't suit us. And so a lot of the furnaces actually kept double sets of books. The ones they so showed the British for what they were producing and the ones they showed to the rest of us. Now, George Washington, at least, uh, had a very convenient source of iron just nine miles away from his home. that little curl on there again. That really depends on the area where you're at. Uh, horseshoeing is actually not the job of a blacksmith. It is the job of a farrier. Now, the further you get from populated areas, the less you can focus in on one trade, one area. And so, Oftentimes, you know, you're out in farming communities, not a whole lot of people around. The blacksmith's going to be taking care of all sort of things, including shoeing horses. But the closer you get to a town or a city, the more you're going to find, you know, farriers to be able to shoe horses. Now, I myself have never made a horseshoe. I don't really plan on ever doing so. Just not my, my area of interest. Now, what really gets confusing about shoeing horses and the farrier's trade and the blacksmith's is the 19th century. <coughs> the 19th century, I've seen a couple things going on. One, a lot of paved roads, a lot more need for horses to be shod. We also see the Industrial Revolution. 
which means a lot of blacksmiths are going out of business. They're losing their jobs, they're losing their practice, because whatever they were making is now made by a machine. And so you see them shoeing a lot more horses, which gives us that, that image that we're used to of blacksmiths shoeing horses. That is an interesting question. What made me want to become a blacksmith? You know, is the only thing I could find where people would pay me to play with fire and hit things. My, uh, my background actually goes back to a um, relatively young age. Uh, I started working at Renaissance fairs uh, when I was about 12 to 13 years old. And at the Renaissance fairs, I started, uh, uh, started in on the military units, uh, working with weapons and armor, um, and quickly fell into the role of the person who took care of the weapons and armor. From there, I, uh, I got into professional cutlery. And so knives, swords, shears, uh, mostly you know kitchen cutlery, uh, but all sorts of other stuff. And it was my job to make, repair, sharpen, whatever was, was necessary. And the process I use primarily when making knives is stock removal. So that's where I start with a sheet of metal, cut out the body of the knife, and then with the grinders and sanders, shape out who it would ultimately be the knife. That just wasn't exciting enough for me. And I wanted to learn how to actually forge one out by hand. <coughs> now unfortunately, by this time in my life, I already needed to earn an income. I already had financial responsibilities. And I wasn't aware that whereas apprenticeships are still available and still the way it's passed down, they typically don't pay. So I had moved on from there to a more respectable career in uh, litigation support. Unfortunately, during the financial crisis not too long ago, um, I had lost my job. And it just so happened that that was the year the blacksmith shop at Mount Vernon opened. Not only had the shop opened, but the master smith was looking for an apprentice. And this was going to be a paid position. So. The day I found that out, I sent the supervisor of the trades unit at least four emails and called him five times to find out if uh, he'd see me. And he did. I got hired on immediately. Um, not shortly after, uh, the master smith approved me as the apprentice 
and I have been working with him uh, ever since. A little over five years now. It is on the same footprint. Yes, it is. And so Washington's uh, shop came down shortly after his death. Um, and an ice house was actually built on the location. We tore down that ice house back in 2008 to reconstruct the shop on the original footprint. Now, the difference is that our shop is about three feet above where Washington stood. And that's for preservation purposes. That way, if they ever have to come back through, do another archaeological dig, we haven't disturbed the location. They can still come in and, and see what was there. Did they find stuff when they were uh, building? They found what's typically found when you do archaeological digs, and that's trash. And so bits and pieces of stuff. They found parts of hammers that had broken off. Um, you know, a little bit of pottery suggesting they had cups or plates or something like that in there. Uh, but nothing whole. Uh, after Washington's death, 1803, uh, they had an estate sale and sold off all the tools because they were no longer planning on using that, that shop. So, got that so far. Now I'm going to put a twist in the center of that. trick to a good twist is a nice even heat. So I'm going to take my time heating this up, moving it around, shifting around in the fire to make sure I have my heat right in the center of the hook where the twist is going to be taking place. The fire itself heating up to the extreme temperatures of 3,000 degrees, uh, more than capable of melting metal. So if I had stuck a piece in there and wasn't quite paying attention to the other person who was working, they could inadvertently ruin what I was working on. Now what you will see occasionally is a blacksmith working with a striker. And a striker would be somebody uh, swinging a sledgehammer. And so if I was working a really big piece or I just needed an extra hand, you might see the striker come in and take care of that. Right there. I love that sound. So, a little wet. 